All Things Alice. This podcast will explore the cultural phenomenon of Alice in Wonderland as artistic landmark and global symbol of inspiration and imagination. I'm your host, Frank Bedore, the author of the Looking Glass Wars trilogy. Let's explore what is it about Alice? Welcome to the show, everybody. My guests today are a pair of super talented game designer and developers, Nick Madonna. He's the founder of PHL Collective, and he's got a new exciting game out, DC's Justice League Cosmic Chaos. And Lee Thomas, he's the creative director of Epitome Studios, and they have an upcoming game, which is based on the movie The Quiet Place which promises to be quite the scare fest. I'm really excited to be chatting with these two geniuses. We're going to be talking about video games. We're going to be talking about movies and, of course, all things Alice. But most importantly, and I think really exciting is we're talking about collaborating on creating a Looking Glass Wars video game. So let's get into it. Welcome to the show, you guys. This is my first podcast talking about video games and talking with you guys that are creators and designers and producers of video games and folks that I'm collaborating with, also people that have a long history in in this business. So to start off, I just would be really curious about what game got you in, got you excited to be in this business and to design games. Lee, I'll let you go first. Fantastic. Um, Yeah, I was kind of lucky when I was a kid. My dad sort of worked adjacent to programming. So when I was very, very small, we had like apricots and, you know, black and green old school like monitors in the house so i always remember playing whatever games my dad liked Mm. so golf golf first of all was the first one i couldn't hit a ball in real life but i could get a hole in one with a computer (laughs) game there's a that was a fun kind of like oh okay i can be pretty i can be good at this that's that's really fun and then i think we got one of the um they were they were called video packs i think in the us but in the uk they had another name yeah, the, the, the kind of the licensing between the US and the Europe, it was still at that point where a console was released in America and a console was released in the UK and they were completely different names, completely different. So on that, we had a, a sort of a Pac-Man clone and a Space Invaders clone and there was a submarine kind of clone uh, game. So that was my first introduction to video games and I, I loved them to bits. Um, but I think the first time I played something where I was like, oh this is interesting. I want to do something with this. It was probably Wolfenstein and Doom. Mm. Those kind of first 3D, you're the player, you control the the kind of the room, your eyes are, the, are kind of like in the game. Um, and I think, yeah, you play those levels again and again and again, because of course you only have the shareware version because, you know, my dad bought the PC. He wasn't going to buy me any games. So I have the, <laughs> the free shareware version. I'll just play that again and again and again. And then a, a friend of mine had the same thing and I called him up modem to modem. And then we were playing Doom multiplayer. And I think from that point on, I, uh, yeah, I, I love games a lot. I fell into movies. Movies are my first love. And I think, you know, when I talk about Alice, it starts with movies rather than anything else. Well, it's interesting that you bring up, you know, your dad, because I was really close with my dad. And so anything my dad was interested in, you know, I ended up gravitating towards. And so, you know, I imagine there's an emotional connection to that time with your dad and playing those games. I I had a similar situation with the golfing that I was a big Tiger Woods fan. So I started by playing, by playing his game. And, and then I think I might've mentioned to you guys when we were in Vegas, I, I optioned the artwork for the 18 infamous golf holes, and I mm-hmm. thought I would uh, I would try my hand. Uh, it I never got across the finish line, but um, <laughs> I really relate to the father son aspect of do finding things that you have a love for and that you yeah. can you can share. And uh, how about you, Nick? What was your first intro into the game space? So. Similar to Lee, but also some differences. We had a Texas Instruments computer 
very early on in the in the mid 80s that kind of did not a lot but it rendered some images on screen of animals that I could press a button and it you know reacted to that and I think that was really my first like true introduction to uh to games but my my main difference was my real like first game system and what really got me into games was a Game Boy so I, mm. I, I my dad through his work made some trades over the holidays and was able to get his hands on a Game Boy um, the original Game Boy like the big gray brick version uh, which was hard to get uh, when it came out so through some trades he was able to get me a Game Boy and a copy of Tetris and that was like my first gaming system that was like my first real kind of like this is mine it's more than a toy like it's got there's something there and I could just sit by myself and play it in the corner and no one would bother me and that is what really kind of I think got me started down the path of being really interested in that kind of stuff because similarly my you know that father-son bond I think is I, you know I had that too but it wasn't around games so it was a, a long time before I actually had my first console my what I bonded with my dad over was comic books and pulp novels and things like that. So uh, Conan and Sherlock Holmes, and we went to the comic book store every week and we were collecting and reading. So like there was certain things that kind of eventually transitioned and helped like, you know, make the, uh, that dovetailed in the games, especially the fantasy and the mystery. And I mean, the latest game that we worked on is a Justice League game. So like there's, there's a lot of love that has kind of like gone from games and the media around games and kind of that's influenced a lot of what I'm interested in now and what I like to work on. What I love about doing this podcast is, you know, everybody that's creative is pretty much touching pop culture. Uh, and we've already been talking about comic books and games. And Lee, you were talking about first love being movies and synthesizing those things to come up with your own creative vision. So Lee, could you just give me a little background and connect the dots from that experience with your dad and creating those games to what you're doing now with Rich Leibowitz at your studio? Fill us in a little bit on that journey. I think that the to kind of follow on, yeah, to, it all goes back to our dads, as is always the case. <laughs> so yeah, so contrary, similar to the golf story, like my dad played lots of sports. And I think when I was born, he had a season ticket for me reserved at Aston Villa, <laughs> which was kind of like our local team. Safe to say, I'm not a big football fan, like that my younger brother ended up being the kind of the sporty kid. I was much more kind of like, let's go towards art, let's go towards the theater. So the other thing I kind of had with my dad, because it wasn't going to be sport, was movies. So it was every Saturday my mom would work and my dad would work during the week, but Saturdays were with dad and father and son. And then when my brother came along, obviously he was looking after him. So for me, it was, let's go to the video store. Let's go to the VHS shop, get what you want. And so it was kind of scanning different titles. And I started with the key, the key Superman, which I think I must have watched thousands and thousands of times like my nan <laughs> literally said i'm not going to come and babysit for lee if he what makes me watch superman <laughs> so um i used to know all the words but i mean what i loved going to the video shop was i looked at the actors and then i was looking oh what else is christopher reeving so i get like somewhere in time and i'd pick up there was a kind of a very old film he did that was really unsuitable for kids and i think we started watching it my dad was like oh no not, not, not this one <laughs> And weird, weirdly, I think it was one of the first times I was ever introduced to Alice as well. The, the 1972, the Peter Sellers version with Fiona Fullerton as a young Alice. So yeah, we, we picked that video up and we took it home and I was not prepared for the surreal, very bizarre 1970s version of uh, Alice in Wonderland. I think I'd, I'd obviously come across the, the book and the tale in some way, but this was the first time seeing it. And I think I saw it before I saw the Disney film as well. It's very, very odd. But I went back and looked at it a few days ago just to sort of refresh my memories of it. And I was suddenly like, oh, now I know why I like Monty Python. Now I know why I like Mighty Boosh. Now I know why I like surreal comedy because it is, it's like a sketch that goes into another sketch, which goes into another sketch, which goes into another sketch. And it really doesn't conform to traditional sort of hero's journey as kind of a lame one to throw out there, but it, it's, it's 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 more like video game narrative you know and therefore and therefore and therefore in games you're always trying to get the player to 
sort of divine where to go next themselves that's the ultimate if you can play a game without the game stopping and saying oh hey go and see this quest or hey go over there if you can get the player to feel that sense of agency it's kind of the goal i mean because alice is so the novel is so episodic i thought mm-hmm. it, they tried to make that work for them in that movie and mm-hmm. by the way uh i forgot that michael crawford was yes. the White Rabbit, and yep. he went on to play Phantom for all those years. And Dudley yep. Moore was in it. I don't remember yep. what part he was playing, but um, but I uh, think he he may play the no. Peter Sellers plays the Mad, March Hare. The March Hare. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And uh, yeah, Michael Crawford plays the kind of the White Rabbit. Yeah, I cannot remember who. Um, there's a, there's quite a few people that pop in it as well. Like especially for me, like they were everyone in that cast was in british kids tv mm-hmm. um yeah british kids tv for those that haven't experienced it in the 80s was really weird right um in, well, a, in a in a fantastic way <laughs> well that's that that's that's a really great story because you uh, the alice not only were you intrigued but the way that the story was told and the kind of humor uh triggered an interest in that kind of that kind of storytelling oh, and that kind of humor. Hey, uh, same thing with you, Nick. Um, you know, you have your uh, PHL Collective company. You're the CEO, or how how do you label yourself, or just the guru of games? <laughs> yeah, I don't even know. It's I, I founded the company, so founder, okay, you're the founder. CEO, so head. I mean, it's whatever. I do whatever needs to be done to make this. Yeah, this well, when you're stuff. when you're an owner of some <laughs> sort, you uh, you exactly. wear a lot of hats. But mm-hmm. connect the dots for me from your you know, your 80s computer to your high tech operation you have going now? You know, uh, it actually started more low tech. So that love of comic books and my, my kind of like weekly habit of going to the store with my dad was what got me started in art. So, you know, I was okay in school, I played a lot of sports, but art was the thing that I really excelled at. And that's what I could really focus on and what it's what I wanted to do. So for a long time, I was drawing comic books and I was uh, taking drawing classes and kind of figuring things out. And eventually at the end of high school, after completing independent art study and and kind of doing that, I applied to an art school uh, here in Philadelphia called the Tyler School of Art. And it's 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 an art school. It's an extension of Temple University. So I went there and I was feeling good. I'm like, I want to do art. Like, this is what I want to pursue. Like, I I would love to be an artist for Marvel or DC. Like, this is like my thing. So I went to the Tyler School of Art and I talked to a recruiter and talked to some teachers and I showed them just this massive stack of sketchbooks I had of character studies and characters and panels and pages that I created. And no joke was literally laughed out of the room because comic books were not they're, they're, they weren't considered by them to be a true form of art that's not mm. a that's not a pathway to being an artist mm. so that like devastating oh my god i still remember this and i hold that grudge to this day <laughs> um, and i should i mean it's, it's you know rightfully so but taking that information and taking that kind of like low point i was looking at and it was in the early 2000s like okay if comic books aren't a pathway forward. Like, what can I do with my art? Like, how can I, you know, utilize these skills to pursue something that I'm really interested in? And games are always important. There was something that, you know, I, I, I continue to play throughout my youth and through high school. And just about that time, there were started to be some programs around game design and 3D art and understanding kind of how to manipulate the computer to output things that are could be rendered on a television or be made on printed on a PlayStation disc. So that started me down that pathway of trying to figure out how do I pivot, utilize these art skills, but do something which maybe has a little bit more of a, a, a path forward, right? Still, still a brand new industry to me at that time and to a lot of people. So I pursued, uh, I pursued 3D art. So I have my degree in, in, in 3D art and animation. And then from there, kind of utilized those skills to work my way up through games, through uh, being an artist, a 2D and a 3D artist, being a QA tester, being in production, being in business development, running a studio. So I kind of like, again, made a third pivot from, you know, 2D art and comic books to 3D art and animation to being just the boring business guy that sits behind his computer all day. But I do more than that. But yeah, I just kind of like, I've, I've kind of just rolled with 
what has worked really well for me and what has kind of been fulfilling. And that's kind of where I am now with my studio and, and, uh, and what we're doing. So I, I you know, I, I really love that story because, um, you know, when you're dealing in, in art, um, and that's your passion and that's your path forward, it's pretty scary. Um, you don't get that much support from certainly from school, um, you know, you're lucky if you get any support from your parents because that doesn't s- spell success or being able to take care of yourself. That sounds like you're going to be in your bedroom at home for the rest of your life. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, and and I also love the 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 pointed obstacle and that there's a visceral reaction still in your body, um, and oh, yeah. and. I, I really have that as well from the many rejections on my novel and some of the very pointed rejections, which were not really about the book, but about my background. Oh, you were a skier or you're a producer, you know, from Hollywood. You're just you're just shunned right away. Um, and so to overcome that and then find a path forward in art is, is something that, um, one, I, I think it's you know, a great lesson. And, and also something I try and communicate when I talk to kids, I do a lot of middle school visits and I really laser focus them on finding something that you love to do. There is a path forward. And so your story is not only did you pivot, but then you had to broaden your, like my dad used to always say, rejection's a great thing, son. And I go, what are you talking mm-hmm. about? Because the door might get slammed on you, but it's going to open up a be- another door and it'll probably be the door that you should have opened in the beginning. And yeah. um, Luckily, my parents saw what I could do and they, they, they encouraged me. There was, you know, to this day, still a lot of fear of like, of, of going into a field that they don't understand, right? Mm-hmm. Just a lot of parents kind of have that, especially with new media and, and a lot of what we do. Um, but seeing that success and seeing kind of, you know, growth within that field and, you know, um, um, seeing that their, their support has made their child successful, I think is, is, is important because yeah, those moments are, are defining. I mean, they're, they're, they're lessons they're they're also kind of growth moments for mm-hmm. you as a person to figure out kind of, okay, well, am I just going to give up on this thing that I really love? Or am I going to find a way to make this work? Am I going to find a way to move forward? And I think, yeah, those are, those are really important lessons. And as we've done talks at schools, because a lot of kids today are are fans of games and they wanted to go into game design. I always think back to that moment and I make sure not to crush a dream early, Yes, but be realistic and say, look, these are the things you need to study. If you are really interested in this, I would suggest doing X, Y, and Z. So I don't tell them it's impossible. I don't tell them, you know, you're, you're, you're terrible or anything like that, but I, I make it, I make it positive and I give them the right kind of pointers so they can go on a similar path or maybe even an easier path than, than what I took to where I, where I am now. I think maybe you should uh, tell a few of them, no, show some rejection. And then maybe in like <laughs> 20, 30 years time, they'll be like, oh, I was at school and this guy came to talk and he, he really hated my idea. And I just thought, yeah whatever get lost dude i'm gonna make this kind of work i didn't it's funny i didn't um i realized frank i never gave you the actual answer to the question that you asked me in the first place but i also never realized that you were from an art background nick like it me and nick met not that long ago but as soon as i met i was just like oh there's something about there's something i got on with this guy and it was just kind of we just saw a very similar direction i had the same thing i drew drew and i wanted to draw but it was never quite good enough and i showed art like went to art college and they're like, well, like what's what's this stuff like that that's that's kind of not important and I've had that relationship through like I ended up going to art school because I wanted to go to film school and I rang up the national film school and was like how do I I'm 15 how do I come there and they're like oh well usually we take people from arts backgrounds great bye and then I was like <laughs> I'm gonna go and go go get an art degree so I went to I went to art school first of all and I, like that the first year of art school is the best year of anyone's life if anyone's listening and they're thinking about what to do next and they don't quite know, just go, go and do a foundation course or go and do a year where you try lots of different, you know, try painting, you try sculpture, you try some uh, uh, sort of technical design or some costume design because, man, like art is just about bringing different perspectives to mm-hmm. view. And I think the more, and this, this is kind of how I ended up where I am, just <laughs> 
Alice, be curious. I'm just way too curious about everything. Why, why, why is that? What, when's that happening? Why is that happening? And then eventually your parents stop being able to answer you and just sort of point you in the direction of books or teachers yeah. or kind of other people. And, and just that carries on growing and growing and growing and growing. And I think that's one of the best things about the game industry versus the, the film industry where I kind of used to work is that in the game industry, by and large, most people are very, very curious about everything. And I think in the film industry, people have much more of a sense of, hey, let's kind of, I'm keeping to my lane. Mm -hmm. This is kind of what I specialize in. The notion of heads of department is a very sort of rigid hierarchy. And that hierarchy exists in video games as well, but it's more often connected to salary banding mm -hmm. rather than actual responsibility on a project. And the reality of video games is so many, you know, you're not, you're not dealing with, you've got the player in the middle of it and the player is completely unknown. They're like this random entity. So you have to think about which way the player is going to turn the game, not necessarily where you want to turn the game. And I think that sort of conflict of who's the author here is, is the, the kind of the main difference between film and games. And I'm really enjoying the game side of it at the moment. That's not to say there's not a lot to do in the film side because that's fun as well. But the gaming part, that sort of unknown entity it's really fun yeah i mean the film business has um you know it's it's difficult um on the business side of it because it's you know it's it's very it's more rigid um they take big swings i know they do mm -hmm. the same thing in the game space but there really is a, a collaborative effort it seems to me to make games really fully realized a little bit more than in movies where if you have a really strong director, they're really, if you give the power to the director and the, and the director is, knows what they're doing, you know, they drive the ship. But in games, it seems like you, there's so many parts that need to, you have to collaborate with. Can you guys talk about that? The collab first, you know, you you recently, you mentioned Lee that you just met each other maybe a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. So could you talk about the how you guys met and how you collaborate and and uh and then I want to get into um the game uh, Justice League uh that you just released um Nick uh so maybe those will aim to discuss that because it's pretty exciting it just came out yeah i think with um it, it's a, it's a connector it's much the same way the film business runs the, the the game business runs as well so me and Nick met because of Rich Leibowitz who runs Epitome who i'm working for now um, Rich, you know, he's one of those, what does Gladwell call them? Like serial networkers. He, mm -hmm. he knows so many people <laughs> and he has a very good profile and an understanding of what drives those people and what they want. And I think when you meet, when you meet so many people, you can sort of be like, oh, if I put these two together and get them to have a conversation, I wonder what's going to happen there. And I think that's, that's kind of what Rich did with me and Nick put us together on a couple of meetings. I got to see Nick work. Nick got to see me work. There was a sort of a mutual attraction, I was going to say there, <laughs> like a mutual admiration of kind of nice, like, yeah. oh, yeah, it's fair. It's good. We're, look, we both have fabulous beards. So yes, like, yeah. Oh, no, that, that, really, that really sounds terrible now. <laughs> uh, we, um, we um, yeah, we just, you know, there's humor. You have to have humor in whatever you do. You have to. If I'm working with someone who has no humor, it's just, it's just over. It's like, yeah, this isn't going to kind of work. So I think as soon as you can kind of find that with someone and you can understand that that person, other people are sort of pushing towards the same sort of quality you are, it might not be exactly what you like. It might not be to your tastes, but if you can sort of see them working, you can see that sort of productivity. It's very, very easy to find good collaborators in the, the game industry for sure. And there's a ton of kind of neurodiversity in games as well. Like it is uh, very, very different to kind of a film. I think if, when I worked in film, I learned about communicating ideas. I learned about how leadership, like, he, like I worked for some great directors and I got to see those directors, you know, yes, they're in control in a sense, but if you really analyze what that control is, they're really just marshalling yes. other great leaders, a great art director, a great director of photography, a great writer, and then a director on the, above. And that director works differently with each of those those three people. So it's like with the art director, you go off and you talk about this and maybe you'll go to a museum and you'll, or you'll look at photographs and with a costume designer, maybe you'll go to a show and you'll talk about, so there's different ways of drawing lines um, or creating these kind of like tighter relationships. And 
So you can enable that person to just push to like keep going further. And I think that's inherent in video games as well, but even more so. And I think a, a great analogy is just think about a, think about a shot on set. So everyone's there, you've got the actors, they know their lines, you've got the lighters, they set everything up, you've got the camera operators, they know they've got their marks, they know where to move the camera from. The director calls action, and then it's these individual contributions, each kind of click into place, and it's like actor gets 30 seconds, the director gets 30 seconds, and boom, done. And quick as a flash, it's in a can, and it's like, okay, well, that's going to be in the film now. In video game, that moment takes months and it's backwards and forwards kind mm. of between each of those departments mm. each and every time. And that's the kind of the main difference is that you have to be a little bit more flexible, a little bit more open to randomness. The best video game companies are the companies that make a certain type of genre and then try and move what they've learned from that game into the next game. We talk about production value all the time. And I think in video games and movies, they mean very similar things. Ooh, great costumes, good graphics, lots of visual effects. But the actual heart of that creativity, the sort of the, the thing that drives either the audience watching it or the player playing it through it, that that's mercurial. And that's what you're kind of trying to capture in a bottle every time. So, uh, hey, uh, Nick, so Lee uh, sounds like he really knows what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so can you Look, fill them. can you fill us in on the truth? Our origin story is uh, is definitely uh, connected through through Rich. Um, so as Lee mentioned, he works for Rich's uh, company Epitome. Rich has been in the game industry for a long time, and we've been working together for the past couple of years. Uh, and Rich is helping uh, me with strategy and business, and just kind of augmenting the uh, efforts that I've been doing over the past you know ten years to grow the business. There's a lot of things that we want to do and a lot of games that we want to make. And um, having someone like Rich has been invaluable uh, to, to kind of our, our like gaze forward into the mm -hmm. future. So uh, I met Lee through Rich. Rich connected us. And as, as Lee said, there was just this, there was something there. Um, a lot of similarities in terms of uh, comedy, movies, games, just there's, there's, there's touchstones there. And that's, that's, you know, that's going to be key to any good friendship or any, any, any collaboration. So um, I think we, we got on pretty quickly and, uh, and we're, we're collaborating on one project, which is an original IP from my studio called Silver Lake, uh, which is a horror title that, uh, that we're really interested in, in, in making. Um, and a lot of the ideas early on for the game and the comic uh, we're bounced off of Lee and we've had conversations and we've, we've spoken about that. So a lot of, uh, a lot of feedback has been really kind of valuable, uh, coming from, from Lee's side of things. And that's really just also helped, helped strengthen our, our friendship, but also, you know, I, I trust his feedback. He's worked on a lot of really great things. And, uh, and I, I, I value that, that, that feedback that comes from, uh, that comes from him. So that's, yeah, I guess that's the that's the origin story. For uh, I saw part. the um, I saw the um, demo for that horror game, and it has a really interesting and dark tone um, that's so different than your latest game, Justice League. Um, yes. I don't think people would if they saw both would connect that it's the same creative force, uh, sort of to Lee's point, um, um, you know, sometimes people get outside of the box, which is, you know, or they're in a box and they want to get outside of the box or, you know, we just have creative ideas. So just tell us a little bit about that game um, and the, what's the premise behind the, and what other horror games would you compare it to? So one of the things that I think is really important for, for any creative is to be able to work on something that they have a connection to or they feel um, a connection to. So while we love the games that we make based on like big IPs like Justice League, internally at the studio, we're also really big fans of horror and survival and a lot of movies and novels that really kind of influence kind of some of our thought process behind this IP. And for us, again, like we want to make something that we would want to play. And that's that's always going to be a driving force for, for, for a designer. As we're playing really great survival games that are out there, we're like, this is really fun, but what if we did it this way? Or what if we added this extra layer on top of it? How do we make this different? How do we inject something new into this genre? And that's kind of where Silver Lake came from. So 
we're telling a story that takes place in the 1930s in the Pacific Northwest, and it's based within uh, indigenous mythology and, and culture, uh, where we have a character who's come back from World War I, who's seen and been through some very traumatic experiences. And as he comes home, he is confronted with the expansion of the Northwest and the industry in the Northwest and how that has changed his family and his tribe's land. And there's a lot of supernatural and horrific elements that kind of are injected into that narrative, which we're, we're playing on to really bring that horror element to it. And then thematically, there's, there's a lot that's, you know, people might not be familiar with everything that happened in the 30s and what people went through and what industry was at, at that time. But thematically, there's a lot of common threads to things that are happening today. So we're pulling on those threads to make the story that we're telling, you know, from all these years ago, relatable to players today. So there's a lot of really kind of important themes and, and things that we're, 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 we're touching on. But essentially, you know, at, at the core of it, we're telling a horror story. We're telling a story about uh, this man's journey, who he is as a person and who he becomes after he goes through all these traumatic experiences. So there's, there's a psychological and a mental aspect to it, but it's a, yeah, it's a really interesting property for us that we're, we're, we're working really hard on and uh, very excited about. One of the reasons I started the Looking Glass Wars, it was very similar to what you're talking about, is to have my own personal story that I could work on and develop and invite people in um, and have control over it. I always describe describe it as my sandbox, and I'm inviting these people to play in my sandbox and go crazy in the sandbox, but I know that that's my sandbox. But Mm -hmm you know, we all have to make a living and that's where the IP comes in. And that's where, you know, I, I'll sell something or I'll get hired as a producer on something. And that's not mine. It's just, you know, it's a work for hire. So tell me the difference about how it is to work on Justice League, which obviously is a big IP from Warner Brothers. And I imagine there were a number of issues in terms of, or restrictions or things you can and can't do. Um, can you share a little bit about that game now that it's public and it's it's being played around the world? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, with any IP that, that you don't own, right, there's always going to be rules. There's things you can do, things you can't do. There's certain things that you need to be uh, wary of because there's other aspects of the brand, whether it's toys or cartoons or movies or whatever it happens to be that like you can't step on um, because you don't want to overtake another product that the same company's doing. So there's always those rules. And we've, we've dealt with those rules for a number of properties that we've worked on in the past. What made Justice League different was the complete freedom that we had, which is, which was like kind of awesome and, and unexpected. So when I first originally pitched this game, you know, I took a lot of my years of comic book love and poured it into this pitch and created a story that reintroduced players to the justice league in a way that was different than how they were depicted in modern media for the past, you know, let's say 10 years, right. It's been the really cool Zack Snyder movies is like really dark, right. Everyone's really super serious and that's great. Those did really well. That's how everyone kind of knows these characters for the most part. Uh, in our game, I really rolled it back to the, the origins of the Justice League and Saturday morning cartoons and what are the things that make these characters so iconic and, and joyful? Why are they celebrated? Why are they why have they lasted this long? And when I pitched that to DC, uh, they saw that and gave us like the smallest amount of notes notes ever. And that was really awesome because I was expecting massive rewrites to this whole thing that we did they saw and identified that we knew what we were doing. We love these characters and we were showing that we love these characters through the game, through the gameplay, through the choices that we've, that we made. And that alone and that kind of confidence in us allowed us to really almost create our own little sandbox within the justice league universe. So we worked really closely for, for two years with, with Warner brothers in DC to make sure that everything that we were doing was spot on. We weren't stepping on other people's toes and, we were representing the characters in an authentic and accurate way that was joyful and fun and, and creative and new. And every step of the way, they were patting us on the back. They were encouraging us to move forward. And it was really, 
uh, really awesome. One of the really great things that helped helped us identify that, you know, sometimes it's hard to tell if you, the work is, is good, right? Yeah. You know, internally, everyone likes it. It's good. You have collaborators or friends saying that, oh, this is really good. I really like it. But you don't know how honest that feedback is all the time, mm-hmm. right? So when we went to a voiceover session for Justice League, um, you know, we made big, big swings to get like top tier talent to be the voices in our game. Uh, we had Nolan North, we had Diedrich Bader, Fred Tatashore. We have these prolific voiceover actors doing voices in our game. And when they started reading the script and they were laughing genuinely, that's when we knew. That's mm. when we felt good. And like that was like, that was the one thing for us. We're like, okay, all right. Mm-hmm. The feedback that we've been given is accurate. <laughs> we can we can now feel <laughs> a little bit better about it. Because, you know, a lot of times VO actors, right, you know, they get in the booth, they do the job. It's that, like you said, it's a work for hire. I got to read these five lines. SAG says I need to be here for an hour and I have to be out the door. Yeah, right. Right. Um, but to be in these sessions with these, with these actors and have their respect and have them laughing and have them saying, Oh wait, what if I make a joke right here? Like this line's great, but like, let me do this little thing right here. Like it was fantastic. And it was, it was, it was awesome. So every step of the way from, from conception to release, we've we've had all these really encouraging moments and critically we're seeing it in reviews we're seeing players love it we're seeing people understand that this is our kind of uh, this is our love letter to mm-hmm. the justice league and to these dc characters and getting that feedback now that it's out there in the wild and people are playing it is 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 really good and it's it's made the entire team really happy and it's you know sometimes when you spend a long time on something whether it's a movie or a game you kind of get lost and you're not sure and you kind of feel some self-doubt before it comes out you're like oh if i see a bad review score i'm just gonna i feel like i've wasted two years of my life right um so i think we've all been there at a certain point but um when we started seeing the reviews come out for this game we were like we were over the moon we were so happy that everyone got it and understood it and um and yeah we're, we're, we're really happy with the reception well congrats on that reception because uh Thank you. it is it, it is a terrific game and you know, and, and I think that point about self-doubt is is important uh, to highlight because, you know, you put all the work in and you're right, your friends give you this feedback. But until you go to somebody who doesn't know you and when they when what was in your mind and what you produce lands in the same way that you thought and wanted it to land for them, that's that is such a great fulfilling tell and you know you've gotten it right. And then to bring up what Lee was talking about, humor, having those actors come in and genuinely laugh at your mm-hmm. lines, you can tell the difference when people are laughing because it's real. On something about Mary that I produced, it was the crew. The crew would break up in laughter and ruin takes. And that's when I knew we had something. I said, this is going to translate because people can't, they can't handle it. Um, And, and so the whole idea of humor being a sort of authentic indicator of what the experience and what people are getting out of, I think is really accurate. So I'm thrilled that uh, the game is doing well. I hope, you know, you do a whole bunch of sequels. So thank you. Me too. We'll say. <laughs> so since my podcast is all things, Alice and pop culture, um, and you guys are game experts and creators, let's talk a little bit about games and pop culture. You know, right now there's a lot of buzz in a kind of a negative way about American McGee's Alice. Um, you've probably read about, what happened that EA passed on doing the sequel, the third in the trilogy. I will just say that I've known American McGee for since the first game came out. I knew the producer um, from Dimension who wanted to make it into uh, a movie way back when. And I've always admired his independence. You know, he's got a studio in, uh, in, in Shanghai, I believe. And I've been watching him, you know, I follow him on social media, and I saw how much work that he's put into this love of this property and this sequel, and yet the parent company that owns it, you know, shut it down, and there's, there was a very visceral, uh, there was a very emotional 
sort of response that he had to it, that he wanted to step away from games and he wouldn't produce games. Can you kind of give us a sense of what that kind of means and why, like, I don't understand how he put so much energy into that game to wait for EA to ultimately pass. Is that a development process or what is that? I, th- I think it's, it's passion, right? It's, I, it's one, it's that time where I always think back to films and I think back to films and I always think back to films. Of course I do. But like, think about how many unrealized projects like, like, you know, David Cronenberg was going to do a Bond movie at some mm-hmm. point. Jodorowsky was going to do June. And so, and it's titles like that. They're kind of like, for whatever reason, the individual contribution and the, the kind of the fuel that has taken this idea to this absolutely epic place that us as creatives can look at and be like, holy shit, that's wonderful. I want to experience that. It's very different from a casual gamer or a casual cinema go- goer, like going to the cinema on a Saturday night and, you know, you're not going to look at a poster for Jodorowsky's June and think, oh, that's nice. I'll, I'll take the wife to see that. That'll be an interesting two hours. You're like, no, that's going to be a spectacular mind kind of futz. I don't know what the hell that is. And I think you have the same issue with games as well. And this is driven a lot by fervent fans. Like fans really do cling on to authorship in games the same way they do for films. So, you know, I'm a huge fan of Tarantino's films. I'm a huge fan of Peckinpah's films. I'm a huge fan of Sam Raimi's films. And to the point where I'm just like, I even watch the stuff that everyone else says is bad. There's something in there I'm going to find that's absolutely brilliant. And I think that that type of fan further exists in video games as well. And I think the difference is, is I think that that sense of authorship in video games is very, very different. And oftentimes when you're building a video game, at least for me, a lot of my lessons have always been about keep thinking back about the player. Like it's less about your vision and it's more about their experience. And it's a weird thing to flip flat back and forward between. Um, With that game, it's huge. It looks beautiful. I can imagine it's going to be incredibly costly to do justice to that artwork. You know, when we have games like God of War, we have games like uh, Horizon, we have games like Grand Theft Auto, where you can feel everything, touch everything, open everything, like look inside and around. There's an expectation that you're going to want to do that to anything as beautiful as some of the concept work I saw for that third game. But it's going to come at a cost. It's going to be, you know, even if you manage to find ways of cutting costs and working with smaller companies around the world and finding individual investors who really want to see that vision. I mean, you're looking at kind of 50, 60, you know, millions and millions of dollars to get to something that approaches, I think, what that pitch material suggests. You know, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, if it can get there, it's going to be fantastic. If it doesn't get there, it's going to be a huge, like, failure. It's going, Everyone's going to be like, oh, God, it didn't quite live up to the hype. It didn't quite get to where it wanted to be. And I think with, you know, with companies like EA and, the bigger companies or any company at the moment with a shareholder, they're looking for quick hits. They're looking for revenue. They're looking for instant sort of gratification or the knowledge that in two or three years, there's at least some kind of money coming back on that investment. I think maybe it's just too big a project at this time to kind of come out of nowhere. The bigger games, when we think about Last of Us, God of War, Grand Theft Auto, quickly behind those is usually a kind of a very tight relationship with one of the big console manufacturers with, with God of war would God of war have been God of war without Sony. It's impossible to say probably yes. Like the, at least the modern iterations, God of war one and God of war two, the ones done in the last few years, it, it's their console selling games. And I think that the, what I saw of the third game is like, yeah, that, that's a console selling game, but it didn't have that relationship. And I think that type of relationship is could push that over the edge. But I can understand why he, you know, post announced that it wasn't going to get financed. And EA said, no, I can see why he sort of wanted to retreat. We've we've all known and met, like, uh, especially you, Frank, you will have met filmmakers who were like, like drumming the the mm-hmm. kind of the the kind of the drum on a particular script on a particular project year after year after year after year. To the point where everybody in the industry is like, "Oh, yeah, I, I know that project," but the public don't, and it just never, it just never happens for for whatever reason. 
there's as many games as there are films, as there are books, as there are albums. I think it's just, it's part of the process. All of us here on the call, we can project forward. We can look at that concept material. We can think about what that game is. We can enjoy it. We can know it. The work that's required to get it to be a reality is, is a lot. And I think that maybe the appetite just wasn't there for that. What do you think, Nick? It, it, have you played that game? It's a, it's a horror game, right? I mean, she's in an insane asylum and uh, the, the Cheshire cat with a crazy knife. Um, you know, it, uh, it's got remarkable artwork, to your point, Lee. Uh, no, I, rem- I, I played the first game. I remember when it came out. I was in college. And yeah, the, the artwork was striking. The, the, the take on this fairy tale that we, or this book that we all know and love, like, was so different. And that really kind of sucked me in and, and a lot of fans around the world. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, to, to Lee's point, it's, it's, it's really, and this is the interesting line that I walk in my role, where it's a business decision and a creative decision, right? So American McGee's creative passion and, and, and kind of his desire to create something that he wants and to put a, put a cap on his trilogy, that's the thing that drove him I'm sure, right, to create this Bible and pitch it and stay on it for so long because it means a lot to him, right? So that alone drives a creative person, you, me, everyone in this room. There are things that we want to do, and whether or not we're being paid, we're going to drive forward to do them because we want to see it through. Right. Now, on the flip side of that is the suit at the company who commands the P&L and wants to see that, as, as Lee said, that return on investment, right? So, you know, and it's also strategy, you know, EA, like a lot of publishers these days are looking for less risk and guaranteed hits, right? So whether that's an annualized sequel, whether that is a game that's almost complete that they can just take over publishing at the end, they're looking for these things that minimize their risk, but maximize their profits, right? This is just like businessman in a suit 101, Mm -hmm. you know? So seeing that okay, Alice might be five years out, it's going to cost X number of dollars, like, that doesn't always necessarily work with the current strategy or the current plans or the current calendar, right? It might not fit in commercially with what they have lined up for the next three to five years. So it's, it's, it's really tough, because with all the passion in the world, and with all the creative juices that we can pour into something, sometimes there's just going to be someone on the other end that's going to say, no, because if we can't fund it ourselves, we have to then go to that other person right. who holds the purse strings, but also makes the call. So I, I like I, I feel for I feel for American. I feel for the fans because you know, we have a number of pitches just sitting on our server here that haven't gone anywhere because of those types of people or those types of situations. So it doesn't stop us from doing it again and again and again. Maybe it's just kind of we're insane. But yeah, I mean, that's just kind of the reality of, of how this stuff works sometimes. And it, yeah. it, it, and it frankly, it sucks. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, th- you're right. I mean, how many pitches have we all, you know, endless stories mm-hmm. that have been rejected. So, you know, it's, it's the passion that gets it over the finish line and it's, you're doing it not for the money. You, you're doing it because you need to do it. But I wonder what your thoughts are on how Alice in games continues to be reinvented. So there's that um, new game, Tiny Tina's Wonderland. There's something about Alice that just every decade is reimagined to reflect some idea that's going on in culture. And I'm wondering if Alice has ever been a muse for either of you, figuratively or literally, and what your thoughts are on, you know, surviving 150 years uh, and, and, and thriving uh, and reinventing herself over and over. I, th- I think Lee touched on it earlier where, you know, when you're designing a game, it's all about the player's experience, right? And, and how do you make sure that they're going through a world or meeting characters or coming up against uh, challenges? And how do you frame all that and make it interesting? And I think there's a direct correlation to Alice in Wonderland's story, right? And kind of her journey through Wonderland and these characters that she meets and these challenges that she faces. And I think that, you know, through Tiny Tina or American McGee's Alice or um, Kingdom Hearts or like any of the other games that touch on this story, I think there's a lot of just commonality there. I mean, there's a, there's a really great comparison to the journey Alice goes on. And Lee, you already said it, the hero's journey is kind of lame, but 
you know, the journey that Alice goes on, but also the journey the player goes on. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of creatives connect those things, which is why you start seeing it be reinvented or you see licenses or games license Alice stuff or people put um, Wonderland or, you know, the rabbit or Cheshire, Cheshire cat, like any of those things into their games, because I think everyone knows the fairy tale. They know the book, they know the story, they know the characters. And it's very easy to kind of map those to steps in a video game or design process or, or things like that. So I, I feel like it's just very, it's very understood. It's very known. And it's kind of a, a almost a short fired hit or a way to guide the player through a, a journey or weird and wild world that has a lot of really interesting things. What do you think, Lee? I think it's a, it's the episodic nature of the structure of Alice that I think is, is good. And if you look at, you know, even if you look at the Disney movie or if you look at kind of one of the live action movies or any of the sort of like the animated attempts, it's usually Alex enters, uh, Alex, Alice enters a room. New things are there. She looks above, she looks below, she looks around, she tests things, then something appears and gives her a clue. And she's like, oh, okay, now I have some context. I may, I may as well have just been describing the first time you play Mario. It's very, very similar. You mm. jump into a room, there's something there, it hits you. Oh, mm. it takes energy off me. You're going to jump on it. You jump on it, you get a con. Oh, okay, this is how it works. So it's a, it's a sequence of, of rules. And Alice is, I mean, we've, we're all, you know, Alice isn't a story that any of us have encountered in its original iteration. Mm. Like we, hundreds of years passed before it came to my ears or like I watched and kind of experienced that show. And so it's always had this sort of, it's been compounded and there are rules that I now think of as Alice in Wonderland were never really there in the original book, but over time they've been included or they've been, done elsewhere or someone's done a parody and then I'm my brain is like I don't remember if that was the parody or if that was the the, the kind of the, <laughs> the note that's very true it's 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 kind of you know and then you've got the, the the Wizard of Oz and then you're kind of like oh okay well it's like is is with the Wizard of Oz like the it's the counter because you've got these two girls both in this sort of period of coming of age one of them that just wants to get rid of all the adults and wants things her way how she wants it that's Dorothy and then you've got Alice, who's on the other hand, that's like, forget the world. Like, I want to go into my head and I want to kind of play with my ideas and I want to play with creativity. And it's, it's, it's just that it's like that precipice of becoming an adult. In Wizard of Oz, it's be careful what you wish for because you know, might not be ready for it. And in Alice in Wonderland, it's more along the lines of, yeah, be curious. Mm -hmm. Do ask, do ask questions, do try these things. I think, you know, I watched that, the, when you watch the Disney version of it, drink that, eat that mushroom, smoke that thing, take that. It's really great. <laughs> Sounds like a three, fun yeah, Friday, yeah. Friday night. <laughs> the, 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 the irony is like, you know, when you encounter that as a child, you know, you're anywhere from three, four, five, six, seven years old. And then you get to school and school is like, don't drink these chemicals. Don't touch these bottles. Stay away from mushrooms. And it's like, huh? So for, for me, it was like, you know, the lesson of like don't trust authority yeah. like yeah be curious but be safe and uh yeah I, I i never stopped doing that i don't generally go into the woods and eat large mushrooms I've learned <laughs> that that's, that's not a safe thing to do yeah. i feel like that's a bumper sticker lee if you want to if you want to go in on business <laughs> yeah. be curious but be safe i think we could do some yeah. big business there. yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, and uh, think, yeah, uh, apparently uh, mushrooms is a big business uh, that's coming our way. So, um, <laughs> oh yeah, hey, absolutely, so, guys. I've heard this rumor uh, going around that you are going to be adapting this book series, The Looking Glass Wars. Um, I know the author, and I know he's a pain in the ass. So, I'm wondering how you're going to navigate that guy to create a good game. And to your point, Lee, his book is not episodic. Uh, I think he wrote the book because Alice is so episodic. So he's got the j hero's journey. So are you going to turn that book back into an episodic series of games, or what are your guys' plans with that book series? I think I think what's interesting on what you've just touched on there with the difference between sort of episodic and story driven and I think this is this is my experience when working with creative especially original IP that's not originally a game and how do we adapt that into the game that adaptation process is is fantastic it's it, it's a really fun way you look at the the books and the original IP and you think about the themes and the tones and the characters and the types of things that you as an author are trying to 
tell your audience. Then as a, as a creative or as a designer, rather than sort of strictly adhere to that and think, oh, I'm going to take this, I'm going to take this. It's like, no, think of it in the abstract. Think about what in a game can cause similar, th- like how can I cause a player to feel the themes in this book, the mm. tone that's in this book. And I think that then, that then starts to suggest a, um, a genre or at least a kind of a principal way that you interact with the game. And once you, you've you got that, then you can think about, well, what are the various different systems? And we're fortunate enough to, you know, video games are rapidly pro- proliferating. There's hundreds of different reinterpretations of genres and systems every year. And so you play lots of a variety of different games you see how those games make you feel and slowly you start to bring you start to have this sort of collage of interesting abstract systems onto which the creative of the ip can be laid over and you have to do that very 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 softly because the first time they come together the creative and the system it it, it usually doesn't work but that's okay because as game designers, that's all we do. We, we solve problems. We know where we want to go, but we see an issue in that direction and achieving that vision. And so we, is it an art problem? Is it a feel problem? Is it a sound problem? Is it a feedback problem? Is it a problem with the original narrative? You just have to look at these problems with lots of different lenses and lots of different perspectives. And then you start to divine this loop, this sensation of like, oh, I do this this happens and I feel that and now I want to do something else and something else. And that that's the sort of the, the traditional loop. All games have kind of loops. Uh, feedback to the player, do this, that's good. Do that, that's bad. Mm-hmm. And so you learn how to divine your way through the scenario. Once you've got those systems, that is the really fun part because now it's a backbreaking work of, well, we want to borrow this bit of the narrative, but can we change that? And how do we push this around? And what do these characters do? And at that time, you know, we talk to someone like you and you, your understanding of that universe is huge, like way better than, than, than us. Even if we read every single word that you'd ever written, our perspective on it would be completely different from your perspective on it. But in that negotiation, in that sort of like talking about the world and the characters and you sort of seeing the systems as well, you, you, you work out how to land it. And very, very clearly it's like airport, uh, you know, beeps and lights, you kind mm-hmm. of the runway appears and you're kind of like, oh, okay, that that's kind of where we want to go. Hey, so Nick, we are all bonded by the same gentleman, Rich Leibowitz, who has been interested in my property for a long time. And he's been a friend. And, you know, back when he was an agent, he was representing the Looking Glass Wars. Um, and he's the person, as uh, Lee had said, that is the connective tissue to this conversation and why we're in this room because I have started to collaborate with the two of you on how to turn the Looking Glass Wars into a game property. And, you know, it's been really interesting for me to share, you know, the sort of the magic systems that, and to be able to articulate uh, all of the logic and rules behind the world that I've created and have that sort of land as a, as a starting point for some of the gameplay. But then when it came to the narrative, it really uh, changed because, you know, you guys, we all agreed that let's start with something that's not in the book. Uh, let's give fresh story elements and bring us up to where the books start. Um, mm-hmm. And I found that to be very exhilarating and an exciting proposition. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about why you think that's important uh, in terms of the game that we're working on? And can you also talk about how we're piggybacking on the game design and play of Justice League? Mm-hmm. So I, I think you nailed it, it, it like perfectly where it's exhilarating to tell a story that isn't a direct adaptation of what's already there, right? There's this great book series, there's this great movie, whatever it happens to be that you're adapting into a game. People know that. They know the beats, they know what happens, and there's almost an expectation as to this is how it's supposed to go, right? The Last of Us TV show is a really great idea of how they subverted some of those expectations, but also expanded upon the universe to make it new and fresh, even though they retold the first game in an eight-episode arc. So 
being able and you being so gracious and allowing us to play in a, a sandbox that exists before the first uh, the first book is that really exhilarating moment where we have an idea of where things are going, but we are allowed to take however many steps we need to take to get to that point. And there's a lot of different stories and a lot of different narrative and really cool moments that happen in those steps. So we could either take our time and do it over a number of games. We could do it over one game. Like that's, that's really exciting. And that freedom is what makes our job a little bit easier because we're not beholden to here are the steps you have to hit these bullet points because this is what everyone knows. So during that, as Lee mentioned, the adaptation phase, you know, I remember I first put together this document that was full of narrative, thematic, film, all these different references that were visceral and exciting that had themes of war and, and brotherhood um, because of some of the characters that we wanted to kind of, that we wanted to touch on uh, in our, in our game, but then also relatable situations, because that's something that's really important for any piece of media is that there's something there, there's some kind of thread, like kind of like we're doing in Silver Lake, there's something relatable that players can understand, whether it's their first time in the world or, you know, their hundredth time in the world. So I remember I put together this big list, which was full of, you know, Band of Brothers and Suicide Squad and this, you know, these different, uh, you know, you mentioned Peck and Paw, Wild Bunch, right? Like there's groups of, of individuals who come together who are going about their business to reach this common goal and the steps to get there might not be easy. They might not all get along. They have different personalities. There's a lot of inner character play and things that happen that lead them towards where they're going, but allows us for a lot of interesting weaving that we can do on the way to that endpoint. So that adaptation process and those, those kind of meetings that, that, that I had with Lee early on, and we were throwing ideas back and forth were, what kind of led us to asking you if we were able to play in the sandbox that exists before the first game, because we think we could do something really interesting here. So that, yeah, th those, those, those types of moments and that kind of creative relationship with, with, you know, an IP owner or, or a writer or an artist are the things that really, I think, help drive a great product. Because if we're just given rules and here's your marching orders go, that really puts us in a box and that doesn't allow us to really kind of flex and do things that we think are interesting. It can maybe help. Right. So um, having that freedom, I think is ultimately better for the product itself, but also better for the fans because they get something new. They get this really interesting take on this cool thing that they love that expands the universe, expands the lore, expands the world and gives them something completely new and unexpected. And I think, yeah, that's not only exciting for us as a creative, but yeah, for, for a fan playing the game for the first time. Yeah, I think it's a good point that it's not just the creative freedom that I'm trying to trying to give to other creators. It's I want their voice. I want it's what's inside of you. You know, it it's what it's part of you. It's who you are. It's how you communicate. It's how you create. You know, if you're a writer, it's your voice. If you're an artist, it's the look and the feel. If you're the game designer, it's you know the playability. And so to to be able to offer that, you have to let go of your own preconceived ideas and and trust and and let that creativity transfer to the medium and the rules of the medium and that audience of the medium and that's why I'm excited about collaborating with both of you and that's why this conversation is is really satisfying because you have deep understandings and perspective uh, uh, and creativity that's your own and that's what you're bringing to it. And, and I think, you know, you're hoping that you make a good decision as an IP owner, but like Justice League, like Warner Brothers and DC, handing it over and trusting that it'll come back and that that communication will ultimately end up in the final product is um, a leap of faith, uh, but that's where the best creativity comes from. It's a big leap of faith for an IP owner. And, you know, as, as a creative, as the person on the other side of it, 
you know, we don't take that for granted. We're appreciative of that because again, yeah, it allows us to do things that we are passionate about, right? We don't, we don't want to just be this work for hire kind of paint by numbers studio. Right. We want to do things that are really cool. Like we have ideas, we have certain things that we think would be amazing. So allowing us to do that is, is very much understood on our side to make sure that we treat it right. We do what's right by the property and, and by the owner. Um, but to also just like do something cool, do something really awesome that's going to take people by surprise. We'll talk about Justice League because Justice League has mm-hmm. exactly that. Um, it has some very cool new kind of playability moments. And you have described to me, you're going to take that engine and create the 2.0 for the Looking Glass Wars games. So can you describe what those features are that players have been excited about that you guys were you know, nervous about or thought would work and have come to fruition. Give us a little inside the picture of, of what you were, what you were thinking and how it turned out. So um, Justice League is, you know, genre wise, it's an open world action RPG. Mm -hmm. So it's a game that gives the player freedom to explore and, and, and tackle the narrative at their own pace. It also gives them agency, which is the RPG element of it all to design and outfit their character, not only cosmetically, but mechanically, to play in a way that feels really good for them. So one of the things that was really important for us, excuse me, in Justice League, was to give players a different experience and give them the tools to make them realize that their Superman can be very different from your Superman. Mm -hmm. Or my Batman can play very different from your Batman. And that was really important to us and we weren't re- actually really sure if dc was going to let us do that but luckily we were we were given the given the freedom one of the things that that that's really important i think in games is is, is that agency right a, a player wants to play a game or they want to watch a movie because they want to implant themselves in a different world they want to put them in a put themselves in a situation that isn't their normal everyday life they want to be fully sucked into this experience and sometimes if the player's just handed a character that's fully formed and has all these skills and knows exactly what to do, it's not, all, it's not always exciting. Mm-hmm. So giving the player almost a blank slate, and, and in Justice League, it's not necessarily true. Everyone has their, their knowledge of Superman and Wonder Woman and stuff, but we've given them a, back, a blank slate in terms of what that, pow- what that character can do and how powerful they can get and how they will play. And those decisions are really important. And they actually play very deeply and tie very deeply into what we want to do with our Looking Glass Wars game, where, you know, we have this war in Wonderland and we have these card soldiers and this really great system and these mechanics that you've given to us through Caterpillar Thread and all kinds of other really cool stuff. We, in a similar sense, want to give the players this blank slate where they are stepping into the role of being a soldier in this much, much larger war that's way bigger than them, that is, you know, overwhelming to a point. But we know that we're going to give them the tools to grow in power over time. So not only are they going to get stronger, but they're going to understand the world better. They're going to know what's going on. And, and that kind of agency and those giving the player a choice and giving them the tools to make those choices, I think is going to be really important sense of immersion for players. And, mm-hmm. and that's something that we always strive to do in our games. And as we build version 2.0 for, for Looking Glass Wars, that's that's going to be a, a, a key feature that we're going to really hone in on um, to make sure that players can, you know, step into this soldier role and be the soldier they want to be, be the suit that they want to be, or the color they want to be, whatever it happens to be. They have the tools to make the choices that give them the coolest experience that they can create mm-hmm. with with the game that we've given them. Uh, you brought up agency, and agency for characters is is universal in storytelling. It doesn't matter the medium; the characters have to have um, you know so, uh, agency that you can understand. Um, so I think you know that's an important point and something that I really worked hard on in the novels. Um, and that I was proud of, and that you're, you know, that 
is also really important in games. So I'm excited about this collaboration with both of you. I'm excited about um, finding a way forward uh, for the Looking Glass Wars to live in the game space. And I have really enjoyed this conversation. You know, the creativity and the imagination and the curiosity is something that we 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 trade in every day. So it's uh, it's nice to talk with like-minded friends and colleagues. But before we go, I'm going to ask a question that I always ask, and that is, if you were a character from Alice in Wonderland, who would you be and why? Lee, Ooh. you can go first. I know you'll have an answer. Do you know what? This is it's this is kind of odd, and I wouldn't normally do this. If you ask me kind of like which of the reservoir dogs I were or which character was a picture, <laughs> I'd pick some weird sort of background cats. But I have, I have I, it's Alice. Like yeah. it's Alice. Like Alice is she has agency, she has control, she can get herself out of trouble, she can get herself into trouble. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's, it's the, the, you know, the curiouser and curiouser yeah. mentality of never stop asking, never stop saying why. And I think it's that message is still true. Yeah. Be curious. Don't mm-hmm. accept anything. Don't just because someone tells you it can't be done. Don't, don't accept that. Yeah. That's, that's the worst thing you can do. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Alice. Curious. How about you, Nick? Well, Lee, Lee took the star of the show. He's number one on the call sheet. <laughs> I'm going to be, I'm going to be lower down on the list. I think, um, no, I, I think, and, you know, maybe this is just my personality or, or just kind of how I would want to interact with the world or kind of the power that I wish I had, but I probably would choose the Cheshire Cat um, as this chaotic force within the world, this comical, conniving, meddling, just kind of just this Mischief. all-knowing character who makes life hard for everyone else. Um, oh, you is, mean a business? You mean a business owner? Nick. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that it's, it's true. You know, it's, it's these things work like that somehow. I, I don't know how. Well, you um, know, it, it. You know, earlier in, in in this conversation, right in the beginning, um, uh, you know, because we're on a on a Zoom call, uh, I was watching you, Nick, um, smile, and uh, and <laughs> as you were smiling, I thought to myself, I bet he's going to say the Cheshire Cat, and if he doesn't. I'm going to say the Cheshire Cat. So, uh, so my mischievous grin. I yes, guess, is that's it. That's exactly <laughs> that's exactly it. So, on that, I'm going to end and uh, thank you both. Um, wishing you a lot of luck on the continuous uh, continuing uh, success of Justice League, and uh, wishing all of us uh, a long collaboration on the Looking Glass Wars. Thank you, gentlemen, for um, for hanging out with me and chatting about all things Alice and pop culture and games and and your love of creativity. Thank it's you, Frank. Been a real I pleasure. appreciate you uh, having us on. Yeah, thanks very much. It was great. Thank you.